Okay, this next slide here, slide 21, they're demonstrating a very simple little concept here. It kind of builds off of the previous slide where we were creating an image that could link to something else, right? We wrapped anchor tags around it, images in between, that becomes a linkable item. We're going to kind of leverage that same approach and take a look at what's happening here. Once again, we have an anchor tag that wraps around an image, but the one that wraps around the image is not pointing to a website. It's pointing to a larger version of the same file. So really what they're doing is they're creating basically a thumbnail. That's actually the image that's showing, a little tiny picture. You click on it because it's clickable, and then it takes you to, the, to a bigger picture. So I think that what would be kind of fun to do here is let's let's demonstrate that. I'm going to be working uh, in Dreamweaver tonight. So those of you that have never seen this product before can see how it functions. Um, what I'm going to do first, and it's really recommended in Dreamweaver that you set up site definitions to do your stuff. So I'm actually going to be creating one. And basically all this really means is that I have a folder where I'm doing my work. I'm attributing whatever project that I'm working on to that folder, and that way when I turn on that project, it goes right to those folders, and I don't have to confuse where I'm putting files. So I'm going to call this uh, Web1, and that's my little abbreviation for Fall 2016. And then I'm going to point to the folder where my work is. All right, and once again, this folder structure here is going to mimic what I have on Kronos. This program has FTP capabilities built into it, so I can do all the work directly in, the, in this environment. So you'll see how, how fun that can be. All right, so the work that I'm going to be working on this time is going to be in this Unit 4 folder. I don't have anything in there yet. But I am going to create a, a new file to work with, and you should do the same thing. And with this piece of software, I just choose the format type that I want, and it is HTML. The doc type I want to choose, which is HTML5, and then I will just click Create. And then you can see it, it very quickly and automatically builds a basic page structure for me, all ready to receive content. So what I'm going to do right now is if you have not done this yet, or if you don't have a template file, I'm just going to pause the video for a second, and I want you guys to create this. Start with a new folder, start with a new file. All right, as you guys are putting that together, I'm going to go ahead and do a save as. That should always be the first step you make after you open or create a file. That's the first step. And I know I don't always follow it, but I try to like right now because I'm remembering to. And I'm naming it index.html. And now I'm all set to work. All right, so the examples that they're giving us, these two images, well, I kind of need to have some images to work with them if I'm going to do something like this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just kind of dig into uh, one of my folders here on the machine, like somewhere where I have pictures. Not that folder. I'm just going to grab a photograph here from my library. copy it. And the first thing I want you guys to do, and this is going to be part of the lecture that's coming up, is go to the folder where you have that file you just created. Hopefully you've done something like what I've done. Inside of my Web1 folder, I just created a Unit4 folder. I created my index.html file. I saved it there. And now what I want you to do is create a new folder inside that folder and just call it images. Now 
Now, I'm following a naming convention of all lowercase. Whatever convention it is that you use, make sure you stick with it so you don't have to be guessing in the future. And then I'm going to go into this folder now, and I'm going to paste in the image from my from my photo library. And then what I'm going to do is I'm also just going to open it up really quick and just take a look at what I have. Eh, it's not particularly great, but it's a cool sunset. We were we grabbed. This is the Rocky Mountains in Montana. We were driving home at sunset, and that was kind of the view of the very purpley looking mountains. All right, I probably could find a better picture than that, but we're going with this for right now. All right, so we have this picture here, and it's huge. I don't know if you guys noticed the file size on it. Can you make that out? It says 2779 kilobytes. That's about three megabytes in size. Remember what I said was ideal file sizes for images? Real small. You know, maybe like 30K, 50K, 100K. No more than 200. You know, kind of like limits like that. You really don't want to get much bigger. So we're talking like one-tenth or less of the file size. So I'm going to hover over the icon here. And as I hover, or as it should, should pop up information about the file. It's not for whatever reason. So I'm going to do a right-click properties and then they have a details tab on a Mac you would do a get info to get the same information all right take a look at the pixel size on this 3456 by 2592 just to give you a perspective on that my screen is 1600 wide this image if I were to project it on this wall would be well over twice the size of this screen at full resolution, right? Way too big. So our job is to resize it. There are some pretty simple resizing tools that, that are available to you both on a Mac and a PC that you can use to change the size of an image. So I'm going to use the one that, that is most common on a Windows platform because I know most of our people are Windows people. And I'm just doing a, a right click on the file, and then I'm choosing Open With. And then we're looking for a program called Paint. Paint is just the default image editor for Windows. So go ahead and open it up in Paint. And you can see what Paint does is it opens it up at its native resolution. Look at the scroll bars. I can like scroll forever and really not see much of anything, but it's absolutely huge, right? All right, so what we need to do is we need to resize it. Notice that on the Home tab, they do have a, a resize option. So if you click that, and notice they have two different settings, percentage and pixels. What we're interested in as web designers is the pixels. So I'm going to have you switch to pixel mode then I want you to make sure that this box is checked, Maintain Aspect Ratio. And basically what that means is that when I change one of these, the other one's going to change proportionally so the image doesn't get out of, you know, proportion, it doesn't skew. Uh, I don't want it 30 pixels, but I'm thinking maybe more like, I don't know, 350. That seems about right. Well, if this is 1600, right, the whole screen is 1600, then... Half of it is 800, so about a quarter of that. I mean, that's about what we're, what we're looking at, right? So maybe even bigger, maybe like 400. Let's go 400 pixels. So it turns out to be 400 by 300. I kind of knew that, by the way. Because on my camera, at least the one I use for these pictures, that's the aspect ratio. It's 4 by 3. So I'm just going to say OK. And then notice it resizes. And that's its actual size right now in, in pixels. The way that I can tell that, of course, is if I go to this view menu, I can click on 100% and see it doesn't change. So that's going to be the actual size that the image is going to end up being. Now, is that too small? Yeah, I, I think it's a little too small. Let's say... <laughs> see, I'm kind of uh, picky sometimes. 
Let's make it more like 650. Oh, it didn't like that, did it? Let's cancel out of there. Give me some weird numbers there. All right, switch to pixels. All right, that's a little better. And this is going to be for the large image that we're going to. So we're going to have a little tiny thumbnail and the big one. So now I'm going to save this, and I'm going to do a save as. That way I'll keep the original intact. And because this is a large image, I'm going to opt to use the JPEG format. And I'm just going to call it mountain-lg for large and JPEG. All lowercase. I'm going to put that in the same folder I've been working in. And then I'm going to need a thumbnail size of this too, which I think should maybe be maybe like this big, something like that, not, not much bigger. Okay, so let's go ahead and do a resize again. And let's take it down to 200 pixels, I think the book did. See what that looks like. That's pretty good. So let's do another save as. I'm going to use the same basic file name, but I'm going to switch it to uh, maybe SM for small or TN for thumbnail. That's a pretty typical thing to do. So I'll just go ahead and save that. And then I'm going to do something before I even work with it inside of my editor, and that is I'm going to come back to the file folder and just take a really quick look. Look at the size of the files. We started out at almost 3 meg, 2779, right, kilobytes. The large image is down to 76, the small one's down to 24. That's the kind of thing that you need to be wary of, because you're going to see how quickly they load when the file sizes are small. And even though we have lots of bandwidth these days, you can't always count on that, especially with mobile devices. Mobile devices can be very um, picky, basically. Now, because I've already made my edits and I still have the original of this image, I'm going to get this one out of my folder structure. And the reason for that is I don't need to upload that to the server and fill up the space. I'll just take the smaller versions. All right, so here I have both of my images. They are in place. Now we're going to jump back over to our editor, whatever tool you're using. And I'm just going to create a simple tag, right? Uh, let's create the image tag. We're going to declare a source, SRC. And then inside there, I'm going to include the name of the folder, a forward slash, and then the name of the file. Now, I remember what I called it. So I can just type it in. Another thing that you can do to make sure that you don't mess up how you type the file name, especially if it's not a, a friendly file name, is you can go to your file folder. On a Mac, you would single click. On a PC, you would just do a right click rename. To highlight the file name, select all of it, control C to copy, go back to your editor and paste. You absolutely know for sure you're not typing it wrong. So you see the, the strategy there? And remember I told you that this is all you need to make it show up on the page. That's it. Let me show you how it works. So right within this product here, I can launch it directly into a web browser by pressing F12. So this is the large image. Boom, it's up on the page. Good. Right. But really what we want to do is we want to have that small image on the page. So I'm going to save it. I'm going to go back to our browser and refresh. Oh, that's not working. What did I do wrong, folks? I'm going to open up the file folder here. File name is wrong. So you see how I demonstrate that to you by messing it up and then you guys can see. 
hopefully notice that I did it wrong because this one it's got a TN in it right because I chose instead of small I chose thumbnail but I forgot supposedly all right let me show you um, what you can also do in a cool product like this and a lot of editors do this so there's initially some oohs and ahs but with Dreamweaver I can actually grab the file from the folder and just drop it into the code and boom it just drops in yeah does put the width and the height in there. Why? Because it's considered best practice. Also an alt tag. It also throws in the closing slash, which is optional, technically, but that makes it XHTML compliant. So there you go. So I'll, I'll get rid of this one here. And let's save it. I'll go back to the browser once again and refresh. And there's the thumbnail, the small version. So our next objective here to follow what the book is doing is I'm, I'm going to make an anchor tag and I'm going to link to that file. So you can see one of the other advantages here. I want, want the large one. And then I'm going to wrap those anchor tags around that image. So when I click the thumbnail it will go to the large image so I'm just gonna go ahead and save this and then I'm gonna go back to the browser again I'm gonna refresh to make sure that it reads the new code and you can see it is now linkable I'm clicking and it takes me to the big image it's a very primitive way to like take a thumbnail image and, and push it to a big image and sometimes that's exactly what you want sometimes your web page is fine with small images and if somebody really wants to see it large they can just go to a whole separate page and see it huge and so nothing else cluttering the screen. It's a very primitive approach but it works quite well. Alright, so that's working with thumbnails. Now some of the next few slides we've already kind of done it, believe it or not because we're talking about optimizing something for the web. Now, the thing that's kind of interesting about this, and I know that on the projector here, you guys probably can't see the details well, as well as I can on the screen, but I'm looking at the image on the screen, and it looks pretty darn good. I mean, it doesn't, it's not any fuzzier than the original. I can, like, really zoom in there. And actually, that's a pretty good, it's pretty good quality considering how small the file size is. And that's our objective here, is to get a decent looking image without a large file size. And there's a little bit of give and take on that, frankly. If you have an image that's got a lot of detail in it and you really zoom in, when you start to work with f certain file formats, you will start to see artifacts when you like compress images to a certain amount. Paint is kind of forgiving because you don't ha actually have any granular control over any of those things like compression. Whereas if I use a tool uh, like Photoshop, and I'm just going to bring that up really quick just to demonstrate it to you, uh, and there's lots of tools that fit in this category. A good free one, and I think I've already showed this to you, is a, is a program called GIMP. So if you want to just Google that, uh, it is a freeware alternative to a program like Photoshop and it's it's a free download runs on Windows I think it runs on Mac and Linux as well um, another one that you might want to investigate and I know the book points this out also uh, and this one's cool because it runs inside of a web browser the web address is PIXLR Pixlr and you'll see it up on the screen. So PIXLR.com. And then you'll see here that they have all these different ways that you can use their products. But one that's really cool is you just use the web apps and the image editor runs directly inside of the browser. And it's free. And then, okay, well, you have to deal with some ads. There's always a price. But who knows, you might like it enough to actually buy the real version. Um, but it, notice it allows you to either grab stuff from your local file system. You can actually point to a URL if the file's out on the web already. Um, take a picture of yourself, whatever, whatever it happens to be, and you can pull it in. And I'm just going to basically grab any image here, probably the same, one of the same ones we're working on, or maybe I'll 
grab one of the generic ones here that's funny all right picture of candles all right and then you'll see that you'll get a whole set of different type of tools so if you want to do an adjustment you can sharpen it you can resize it you can crop it and this is all free stuff another tip I can give you too is if you guys take pictures with your phone which a lot of people do you can have it like sync up with your Google Drive or if you want you can just manually upload stuff to Google Drive and then they have photo manipulation tools inside that environment as well now I'm gonna go back to Dreamweaver real quick and what I'm gonna do oh this is the perfect one because I used it as an example before <laughs> that guy looks real happy doesn't he Now what's neat about a tool like this, I mean, aside from being, you know, top flight image manipulation tool, industry standard basically, is it has some components built into it that are really designed for, for web people, uh, basically various export scripts. Um, and the one that I always like, and now they're calling it legacy all of a sudden, is this tool called Save for Web. And what it does a really great job of is showing you a comparison between all the different image formats and the resulting file sizes that go with it. Now this image here is already optimized for the most part because if you take a look down here in the corner, and I know it's very hard to see with this lighting and that small font, is it's already a fairly small file. Um, now I can choose different file formats. Notice just by switching from a GIF to a JPEG, I don't know if you can read that or not, but now it's only 21K in size. But it has this other really cool feature, too, that I like, that given whatever size you create your image, it will tell you how long it will take to download given a certain internet speed. Right? So this particular image, over a 1.5 megabit, which these days is actually kind of slow, uh, connection, it will take one second at 1.5 megabits. All right, not a big deal. What if you have 50 images? Hmm, right? So that's when you start to think about those download sizes. You're going to have somebody waiting a minute to see their web page? All right, so these are think little considerations. Um, but this is a great tool because you can do a lot of the same things that we just did inside of Paint, a much more primitive tool, resize it, save it to a different file format, and basically reduce the size of the file to a workable, you know, level. Um, but the whole reason I show you Paint is because it's already built into your operating system. On the Macintosh, you have a tool called Preview. It's a photo viewer, but it has the capability of doing a lot of the same tweaks. So you'll want to have at least one of these basic tools at your disposal while you're working with images just to, you know, be able to to do the things you need to do. So <clears throat> they point out some tools here. Fireworks is kind of a dead product, which is I'm really surprised that it's listed there. But I think I, I pointed out all three of those, plus there's ones that are natively built into your environment, plus there's other ones that are free. And if you're really inclined to maybe get one, one of the real tools, um, you can always get a discount on it as a student. If you guys want info on that, just contact me and I'll I'll uh, give you the info that you need. All right, whenever you're naming something, be descriptive, right? Pull stuff off of a camera. Sometimes it's not all that descriptive. Um, the reason that's helpful is because, you know, you're putting a web page together. When you're looking at your code and you have a picture of a mountain, it's better than, you know, some cryptic number. You know exactly what you're looking at, and it helps you not make mistakes, basically. We already did a little bit of this, too. So you can see that wherever you're creating a folder to hold your project, that you should, at least by convention, create separate folders for the type of content that you're adding. One of the basic conventions is to have some sort of a folder to hold images. From the you know generic HTML coding standpoint, the, the convention is all lowercase folder called images. You can call it pics. You can call it whatever you want but just know what it is. But the, the reason we have conventions is that way somebody else can sit down and look at your work and not have to be guessing at what you're doing. A 
think one of the other parts of this slide that was important is to make sure you also include that folder name in there because if you're calling the file from here which is one folder level up you need to navigate into the folder and then go to the image so just always remember that they have a couple little uh, newer HTML elements I'm going to try a copy paste here and maybe I'll get lucky and it'll work just fine sometimes when you copy and paste from these external environments it doesn't work so well this actually seemed for the most part okay except we got these weird characters here see those so my, my point is I'm going to demonstrate these tags and I don't want to type them all up by, from, you know, by hand basically now they have a different image here right what I'm going to do is I'm just, you know, I'm going to kind of use the image I have. So I'm going to grab this particular one, and I'm going to get rid of the image tag that I already created. So I'm actually going to get rid of all this stuff. What was the size of mine? I don't remember. You actually remember? That's That's very good. I'm still going to leave it off. <laughs> and you see I'm just changing a couple of things here. I'm just going to save it. Let's go back and take a look. Oop. Wrong program. That's not a browser. This is a browser. All right, the image is still on the screen, right? But what we did is we wrapped some tags around it, and those tags are a figure, so it's kind of grouping that image together with the image and the caption that goes with it. Now, one of the reasons you do that, basically encapsulate it inside of a figure tag, is that way you can manipulate that collectively. So I can move it, style it, arrange it, whatever way I want, and all those pieces move together. Because I could make it appear just as well without the figure tag. But the reason that we use that is to, to encapsulate it. Image goes with caption. Okay, that's, that's one of those uh, cooler new tags that they have. Here's some other cool tags and and what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to copy the code and paste it and I hope that it pastes just as nicely as the previous here's some uh, some newer HTML tags ones you know frankly not ones I use commonly but you'll be able to see very easily that they could have a very cool effect that's kind of cool I think right and that's all generated with this code. So you have the, the meter tag. There's a value that you're putting in. So that's how far up that green bar is going. And then it also has a minimum and a maximum. So you have a scale starting at an ending point. Now, these are kind of weird, but you can actually, when your skills advance, you can write JavaScript code that would feed those values in. So you could actually have something that reacts programmatically to something you're doing. But this is kind of a neat one. There's a couple more neat ones that are coming up on the upcoming slides. That's one that I won't force you to put on a page, by the way. Here's another little snippet of code. This is also one of the newer HTML tags. It's a, it's a progress bar. In fact, I don't even need this text to go with it. I scroll down I can see the progress bar not very exciting without any text to go with it right but you can do that as well and once again if you look at the code that goes with that oops you have value and a max and then it 
scales. Now, you can also put a minimum in there, but if you don't put a minimum in there, it assumes zero, that, just so you know. Now, let's get to stuff that's a little bit more interesting. Now, I have a sunset here that I'm playing with, and I kind of am putting together a page, and, and really, I'm not really liking what I have so far, frankly. I don't know how you guys feel about it. I'm going to actually get rid of this meter stuff and the progress bar, and I'm probably going to get rid of the mountain image. And I think I'm going to kind of go with the same theme that I went with last year at this time when I was doing this. Anybody watch The Walking Dead? Right? Okay, I figured most of you do. I'm going to create a, a web page about The Walking Dead. That's the way we can talk about zombies in class and have it count for something. So I'm going to actually build the skeleton of a page here. You guys should follow along if you can. I'm going to create a wrapper, and I don't know if you guys remember me doing this last time, that's going to encapsulate all of the page contents. The reason I'm doing this is so that I can take the content and not have it go all the way to the edges. I can kind of narrow it up and control it. All right, so I have a, uh, a wrapper wrapped around the whole thing. Now. I'm probably still going to use the figure tag and a caption, but I want a different image. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to jump out to the web really quick. Hello, Google. And I'm going to do a, a quick image search here. All right, and I'm trying to think of one now that would be really good kind of top center of a page. You know, this one here is kind of nice. I'm looking at the size of it. Oh, looks good. What do you think? <clears throat> good. I'm glad you agree. Notice I clicked the view image button there. And that brings me to a page that actually isn't really a page. It's just the image. So I'm going to right click that image. And I'm going to do a save image as, and I'm going to drop it into that same folder in unit 4. And then this one here, that file name is pretty friendly, right? A little long, but easy enough to understand, so I'm going to keep it. And so I'm going to come in here now, and I'm going to actually refresh my folder view. And I'm going to, no, I don't want to delete the file. I want to delete this text. Once again, I'm just going to retype that images. And boy, that's a long file name. I'm doing this with intent, folks. Here's that right click, rename, control A to select all, control C to copy, escape to not change your file name by accident. And I'm going back to my editor. And then I'm going to paste that in. And let's save that. Take a look. It's worth taking a look as we're working. This is my page so far. Kind of big, right? Okay, you guys see where I'm going with this? I'm going to change the file size. I'm going to do all those same steps because repetition is going to be the thing that helps you guys totally get it. So I'm going to open that. There it is. Took a little while to respond. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it much smaller. Before I do that, I'm going to look at it on the page and go, you know, I probably want it to be maybe like this big, you know, something like that. that. That's my guess. So I'm going to switch to pixel view. I'm going to narrow that up to maybe 150. That's a little on the small side. I'm going to control Z to undo that. Let's make it 
200. A little better. So now I'm just going to do a save as again. I'm going to basically keep the same file name, but I'm going to change full to small. Let's go back to the editor, and then I'm going to change that to small. The other thing I'm going to do is what we learned earlier is I'm also going to make it clickable so that if I was so inclined I can look at the big picture by clicking on it. Alright, so you see that I wrap that smaller image inside a link or an anchor tag that points to the larger image. So I'm saving it and I'm going back once again. Now I'm going to refresh. So there's my small image. I click on it and I get the big image. Okay. So that that's just to kind of reiterate the topics that we just learned. But now, let's add a couple more things into the mix here. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create, have we done this yet, external style sheets? Yeah, just a little bit, right? So now we're going to create a new file. You guys with me? Say yes. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to come up here and create a new file. It's going to be a CSS file. So it's just a plain text file is all it is. You do not need to have this stuff at the top, by the way. That's just something my program dropped in by default. And I'm going to go to save it right away. So I'm doing a save as. And I'm just going to call it styles.css. Now, in order for me to apply styles in my HTML document, I need to create a link from my document to my CSS file. All right, here's one, another one of these little helpful tools in a product like this. So there's the code to create the link. So if you want to take a moment to, to copy that, that's fine. No. Well, you know, it, the thing that matters is that it's inside the head section. You could put it above the title and it'll work just fine. But it has to be in between this and that. So that just creates that external link. Now I'm ready. I'm going to save my index file there. Now I'm ready to start entering in some styles. The thing that I'm most concerned with initially is I have that wrapper, right, that I created that holds the whole page. And if I want to place a style on an ID, and just to refresh your memory here, I gave it an ID of wrapper. Real important concept to latch onto. An ID, when it's on a page, has to be unique. You can't have two objects named with the same ID. To address that inside of your code, you use a pound sign in the name of the ID. And then my objective here is to create something that narrows up in the page. So I'm going to choose an arbit arbitrary amount here of like maybe like 900 pixels. And then I'm going to go margin, left, auto. This is probably what the book had you do. And then I'm going to save it. I know you guys are copying my code, so I'm very slow to switch screens. And actually what I'll do is I'll just make this not quite so big, and the problem will be solved. And I'm going to do a refresh, assuming that I did a save.
and there it is. Now the question is, did it work? How do I know that that worked or not? Because it's not centering. Right? I just told it to, like, margin left, right, auto, gave it a width, and it should center. You know what? It, it actually did. You're just not seeing it because the stuff inside of it is off to the left. See what's happening? All right. So to be able to see it, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to apply a background color to it. This is something we've played with already. And I'm doing this for dramatic effect. This is not the color I'm going to keep. There's the red background. That red background is only on the wrapper. So you see what it did? Now you can see the actual object on the screen. Notice it's 900 pixels wide and the contents within it sit to the left because that's just where they sit. And it's only as tall as the contents within the structure. Isn't that interesting? Now, red's a bad color and 900's probably way too wide. Right? <laughs> well, I, I think. So what I'm actually going to do here is I'm going to choose to switch to a percentage for now, and I might switch back. We'll see. And let's do, let's actually do like 70%. That, that'll probably be good. Um, that background color red, I'll leave it for right now just so we can see the, the difference. Did I save that? Switching so quick, I'm not even sure that I did. Okay. And right now, I'm not sure if it's refreshing. Do you see the hourglass on my pointer? Thank you, Google. I thought it was Internet Explorer that did that. Here, I'm not, I'm not sure if it's actually refreshing, so you see my technique here? I'm going to paste the URL into a different browser. Yikes, that's a Microsoft browser. All right. All right, so 70% turns out to be about the same. All right? So maybe it did refresh. You think that was a lucky guess? Pretty close to a lucky guess, actually. All right, let's make sure that it's working. Let's change it to, like, something much different, like 40%. Okay. All right, and that, we know that worked. That might be a little too small. Let's bring it up to, like, how about 55? We'll go with that for now. We're good? Okay. Now, we're going to keep adding to this. One of the next slides that's coming up in the slideshow talks about background images. All right, and... and really getting to learn how to work with a background image. Now, we're working with The Walking Dead here, so we got lots of good material that we can Google and find. Ho hopefully all of it meets, like, the student code of conduct here, right? <laughs> so I'm looking for something that might be a good background image. All right, and I have some ideas in mind already, and I have some ideas about how I might want to employ a background image, but I also want to kind of show you how not to. So I'm going to start with how not to. All right. So I'm looking at this image. Oh, well. Thanks, Gateway. <laughs> Interesting. All right. How about Glenn? I'm going to take a... All right. There we go. That's actually a pretty nice picture. I might use this one. You guys notice, though, when I'm hovering over it, how this changes from a pointer to a magnifying glass, indicating that's not the full size this is? Holy cow, that's huge. Yeah, let's practice our resizing skills again. I'm going to right-click, Save As, put it in my folder. I'm just going to call it Glenn. Two ends? Sure. And let's open that up in our software right away. Should put me right in that folder. 
and then I'm just going to resize it and watch here I'm going to pick a very small number like 100 I don't want it to be very large that's on purpose alright so I'm going to go ahead and save that I'm going to go back over to my editor now and I want to create a background that's going to go on the whole page so I'm going to begin the basic structure of my CSS and then I'm going to add inside of it background-image and then I'm going to choose a file I'm going to say URL images what's it called? Glen dot jpeg All right. Now I'm going to save this, and then you're going to see the result of it, and we'll talk about what's happening uh, inside the browser when you take a look. I'm going to refresh. Wow, that is something, isn't it? All right. So what happens by default when you use an image in a browser window? The browser will take that image and use it as many times as possible to fill the screen. So it will tile, is what it's called. So it, first it, it will repeat across the screen, that's the X direction, and then it will repeat down the screen, which is the Y direction. So we have an X and a Y axis, so X goes across, Y goes down. This will repeat infinitely in either of one of those directions to fill up the screen. It doesn't need to repeat, but clearly Unless you're going for a fan page all about Glenn, this is probably not a great choice, right? So, maybe we can try a different technique. We can do something like this. Oh, that didn't work. How about something like this? I must have had my syntax off there. Now it's not working at all. Now what's going on? Well, let's try this. Let's save it. Okay. That's what I was hoping to do above. I'm not sure why it didn't work. Uh, typically what you can do with all these background, oh I know why, because I was saying background image, if I remove that, I can apply any of the background styles just using the plain old background tag. So just to show you how that works. This is repeating X, I just refresh to make sure, and then I can also repeat Y or not repeat at all it gives you a lot of different ideas not only that this is kind of interesting too I can do stuff like this Yeah, so I can go top, right, left, bottom, center, top center, bottom center, left center. You can, all like those major positions you can grab. And I better plug in. All right, so I think you guys get the idea with that. But clearly, that little image of Glenn is not very useful for us. At least not there. So I'm going to go back to my image search and I am going to find something that might be a little bit more conducive to a background of some sort. So what I'm looking for is probably a larger image. That's graphically rich. You guys see any that you you are favoring that aren't too graphic for school use?
Don't get so excited by all this, folks. All right. All right, how about we use this one? The bloody bat? No. This one here? Yeah, that's kind of a nice one. All right, once again, I'm going to go ahead and grab this image. This is a very large image. I can tell already. So now that I've downloaded it, I'm actually going to click here, go show on show in folder. And what I'm going to do is just check to see what its file size is. All right. So it's telling me it's 2,000 by 1,000. And the size is 580K. It's a little big. But keep in mind, I also want it to fill the background. So I want it kind of big, but not too big. So what I'm going to do is I am going to resize it a little bit. So I'm going to open with paint. I'm thinking that maybe half that size is fine. So I'm going to do 50% smaller. I'm just going to save it with the same file name. Get these out of the way. And now I'm going to go back to my editor here and I can see that that file is now right here. So on the body background I'm going to type in that file name. What was that file name? Rick and Carl in The Walking Dead. Hopefully I type it right. Looks pretty right, almost. Yeah, just cut that one myself. All right, and then, yeah, I probably want it to not repeat. I actually don't want it top right at all. Let's just see what this does. So I'm just going to go back now. This is my web page. Refresh. All right. We're getting there. It's not quite good. It's not repeating. <laughs> it's kind of behind that red box. That's not good. It's not filling the screen. I'd like it to fill the screen. All right. How about we do this? It, we're about 53 minutes into this video. Let's take a break, and when we come back, I'll show you the little magic that will make it fill the back of the screen and how we can see it right through that red box. Okay, I'm just popping back over to the slideshow here real quick and taking a look at some of those repeat options. And the thing that's interesting that you're going to see here is they're working with a couple of different images. They have this little like butterfly thing, and then they also have these little, you know, like a little rectangle with colors in it, and they're just showing you what happens when you repeat in the Y direction the X direction and if it doesn't repeat at all and what the image looks like. So you can actually kind of leverage those backgrounds to kind of do some kind of fun things really. Now here you're seeing that approach that I started with which was background image and then I did background repeat separately. And then the thing that you'll also learn is that you can just use the singular background and then combine any of the aspects that you could use separately in one tag. And the other thing that you're going to notice here is that they're also taking and putting in two different background images at the same time. That's possible. What they're doing is they're using that it says trillium foot gif and that's that little uh, flower. And then they're also using that gradient or basically that what, I don't know if you can see it in the background here, where it goes from dark green to lighter green. And they're using both of those things together. So you can kind of leverage it to, to create certain types of effects. And I just want you to be aware of that. No, well, yeah, I, does it layer them? Um, I want to say it reads top down, so whatever comes last will sit on top of whatever came first. So you get, there's a little planning that goes with it because you can create some pretty horrific things with it as well. So, and some of that just comes down to um, 
you know, just basically trying stuff and getting it to work. All right, so now what we're going to play with a little bit, we're just going to kind of leverage up that um, that background just a couple more notches. So we've decided that we have this image. Clearly, we don't want it to repeat, but at the same time, it would be kind of nice if it filled that whole screen. So let's go ahead and throw in a little bit more directive here. And watch what I'm going to add. And since this is running a little bit long, I'm just going to press enter and kind of move this over. Remember, white space is ignored. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tell it to center in the x direction, center in the y direction. Let me save that and you can take a look at what that does. Notice it, it did center in the y direction, but what did it center on? The page contents. It's kind of interesting. Zach. Uh, no, you do that in the CSS. You don't, do not want to do it on the HTML tag if you can help it. All right. So the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a couple more directives here. This one will keep the image in place once I finally get it where I want. But there's also this other little tool that I like to use. And I'm going to show you basically two different techniques here. And what I'm doing is so I don't have to type it all. is I have this little trick, and this one I discovered actually a number of years back, and it was such a revelation when I found it. Um, there's the basic CSS style is background size. Okay? And there's a directive called cover, and that means cover the background. Whatever it happens to be, just make it cover the background. The problem is it was kind of a newer tool back then. Not all of the browsers supported it. So what you would have to do so that the browser would recognize it as its own native style is you would add in what we call a browser prefix. You guys are like, okay, what does WebKit mean? Well, what WebKit means, that refers to the engine that drives the browser. Google Chrome and Safari on an Apple use the WebKit rendering engine. That's what drives those browsers. They look, you know, things that you render in those browsers will look almost identical. When you're using Firefox, you use Moz. That stands for Mozilla. If you guys know that, Mozilla is, used to be Netscape, became Mozilla, then became Firefox. But that's the browser prefix. What do you think O is for? Opera. You guys ever hear of Opera? Some of, well, if you haven't heard of Opera, Google it and download it and try it. Uh, the other one that sometimes designers will throw in is this one. Guess what that one does? No, that's not even the tag. This is the one that you would use. So the Microsoft browsers have their own. Now, in an ideal world, if these are all supported by the browser, I don't even need to use them. Did you know there's a website that lets you know if a tag is supported or not? So this is the website. It's called caniuse.com. So I can just type in here background size apparently all of them support it notice old browsers though old internet explorer all right but it looks like there's pretty good support 
So I guess I probably don't even need those browser prefixes. We're going to find out in a second. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to comment them out to start with. And then if I need them, I will bring them back in. So I'm going to save it. Back over to our browser. Ooh, getting closer, right? And what's neat about this effect is no matter how big I make the window, it will follow. Absolutely applies to mobile as well. This might not be the best image for mobile. Then there's other techniques for, for dealing with that. You can create what you call media queries. We're not quite to that chapter yet, but we'll, we'll talk about it soon. The other thing that I promised to show you is that background, right? Well, now we can, we got it. It seems to work okay, right? So I'm guessing that we can probably get rid of these, but I'm going to leave them there just in case, because then if I discover it in a different browser it doesn't work, just uncomment it and I'm all set to go. But I want to be able to see through that background color that we're using here. So what I'm going to do is instead of doing red, I'm going to go pick a color. And actually, I forget that I'm in this environment. So if I do background color, I can use their built-in color tool. Pick something that's kind of in that color. I want it to be maybe a little transparent. This is my transparency slider. No. A lot of, a lot of the better editing programs have something like this. And I'm going to choose the output to this RGBA code. <clears throat> and here's the code that goes with it. So remember the way that RGB works. It's red, green, blue, and then opacity or alpha. So I'm going to save that. Now you're going to be able to see through that box. Pretty slick, eh? So now I can start putting stuff in the middle. And even though there's pictures there, I can kind of work around it a little bit and make it work with whatever I'm doing. I'm still not crazy about the background image, basically because the image part of it is like going to be obscured, but we'll see what we come up with. We'll find some way to work with it. All right, so that kind of settles that part of it. All right, a couple more things about uh, images before we wrap up this chapter. We have this thing called an image map, and that's kind of an interesting thing uh, to play with as well. In the old days, it was very difficult for us to basically create stuff that was graphical, that was linkable, and was well arranged. So a lot of times what we would do is we would create a graphic inside of a program and then throw the whole graphic up on the screen. And the graphic might even be a graphic of a menu where it looks like buttons. And what we would do is we would use what they call an image map to basically draw a shape around the image and make that little zone clickable. And that's a technique you can still use. Probably the, the, you know, frankly, the only real practical reason I see to use something like that is think about going to like a website, like for example, like I'll shop, shop for auto parts, right? Go to like the O'Reilly website and they'll say, well, select a store and you go to this thing and the map pops up. There's a little map of the United States and you can click on any one of the states Right? And how do they do that? They do it with an image map. And the way they, they figure that out, basically, is that whatever that image is, wherever it's placed on the page, there's XY coordinate systems. The top corner is 0, 0. When I increase the X, the first of the coordinates, it will go this way. If I increase the Y, it goes that way. So what basically what ends up happening is you find the beginning point and the ending point for a rectangle. And then it will identify that region of the image, and then you can make it clickable using this approach. Now, generally speaking, I will dissuade you from using this approach. There's better ways to do it. But this can be a viable technique in certain situations. So I'm not going to demonstrate it, but just to give you that idea. One thing that is kind of helpful, though, and you probably have seen this in browsers, is with a little icon. Is something other than the little default icon that pops up? Well, here you go. Let's grab that little snippet of code. I'm going to bring it over to my document. It's going to go in the HTML file up in the top section and put it right underneath my CSS link. 
Now, I don't have an icon yet named that, right? So I need to find one or create one. I'm guessing that somebody out on Google <laughs> has already created one for us. It seems to be the case with just about everything, right? Notice what I'm typing there? Oh my god, there's so many. I, I'm kind of leaning towards the little zombie guy. What do you guys think? All right. Once again, I'm going to do the same techniques. I'm just going to save this image. That is not a friendly name. You guys noticing that? In fact, the name I need it to be is Fave Icon, F-A-V-I-C-O-N. I'm not really sure how to say that even after all these years. I hear people say Favicon. <laughs> but let's just try it and see if it works. So I don't know if you noticed, but when I saved it, I actually changed the file extension. Yeah. The question is, will it or will it not work? Mm. All right, I'm going to save this, and I'm going to go back to the browser, and I'm going to do a refresh. A refresh. It's not working. There's something more to it than it just being an image. Am I refreshing the wrong page? Where's my little icon? I'm not getting an icon. There's something about the file format, too. Here's another helpful little tip that there are websites that will generate them for you. How do you like that? Can they make it any easier for us? So I'm going to choose a file to turn into one, and I'm just going to go back once again to my folder here. That wasn't what it was originally. I probably should change the file name back to like zombie icon or something. I'm trying to get it back to the file format that it was so that it converts properly. Okay, so that's the one I'm choosing. Click the button. That's the one I should click, right? No. <laughs> Download it from right here. Alright, there it comes. It comes down as a zip file. I also want you to notice that they're giving you information here for how you might want to include that icon on your page. And it actually is like, oh my god, all of that. No, really all you need is, is one of them. You just have to make sure that uh, in, in, well, the ones you'll choose are the ones that are in this format. And you'll want to pick a size. So basically what happened here in the zip file, if I open it up and unzip it, you're going to see that they provided a gazillion different types. Right? Really, I just want this one. So I'm, I'm going to extract it all anyhow. Yeah, I'm just remembering people watching the video aren't seeing that screen. All right, and somewhere we just opened up another folder like that. Get that same file name. All right, I'm not going to go hunting for it. I'm just going to unzip it all over again and make sure that's checked. All right, so you see it made all these different versions. But like I said, I'm only interested in the one that's just that one right there. So I'm going to copy that and then put it in my other folder.
trying to find that folder. There it is. And then I'm going to go back to my code one more time. And I'm also going to notice that that's not going to work because it's in my images folder, right? So now with any luck, really it's more than luck, but we'll say that anyhow. There's my little zombie. See him? So that's how you do one of those. That I would call icing on the cake. That's not really required for a website. But when you notice that you have these tabs, and it's very easy to see which ones are the Google ones, right? Because you identify them. So you can create something that's identifiable. This little zombie is not really a good choice because I can't make out what it is at that size. So usually pretty simple images are, are most appropriate. All right, back over to our PowerPoint here. There's also this thing that we call sprites. Um, and sprites are kind of an interesting thing. Basically a sprite sheet, and I should probably just Google it so you can, it's probably easier to see it that way. So basically what a sprite sheet is, is something like this. And maybe I should actually, yeah, here we go. So these like different versions of kind of like the same thing. So you get like, for example, and I, I'm, I've never used these before, so I'm not claiming to know what's in these. All right, that's not really a good example. But basically what it's going to be is an image file that has many versions of the same image. And then what you do is instead of loading all these separate images, you load up a portion of that image. And then because that image is already in memory, you can go between all the different ones by just making these little adjustments in your code. And you do it all mathematically. But that's what they call a sprite sheet. Uh, that's when I'm also not going to demonstrate. Uh, it can be used in some capacities for doing good things. Um, some more things about some uh, where to get graphics. You guys can see what I was doing as I went to Google and I'm like just grabbing stuff. Is that generally okay? Only in a classroom environment. As soon as you try to monetize it, you got problems, right? Um, so one way you can avoid some of those problems is when you do these image searches, you can actually click on these search tools here. You notice this little drop down for usage rights, and I think I pointed this out last time. But look for ones that are labeled free reuse. Those are free to use. The ones that are for reuse with modifications mean you can download it, do something with it, like recolor it, stretch it, add to it, and then you can use it. But if they're not allowed for reuse, I would stay away from it, generally speaking. For educational purposes, we kind of get a pass. So, we got some little tips here. I think we've talked about all these. And I'm pretty happy with the fact that we covered all those things. And now we'll get to like the final couple things we're going to do. And these are all CSS things to wrap up the chapter. All right, one really neat little CSS effect, and I'm going to demonstrate this one, is this thing called border radius. And border radius can be applied to anything that is a block level element. So, for example, the wrapper on my page, right, it's a block level element. I can see it because I gave it a background color. I could also make sure that I see it just by virtue of giving it a border. So for example, I could add to this border let's make it two pixels solid black. Alright, so there's yeah, it didn't have the background before, but now, now you can see the border. It's black, right? helps it define the edges a little bit. The other thing that I can do now is take that border radius command that they're talking about. And I'm going to choose some arbitrary amount, like maybe 8 pixels.
And you see a little bit of rounded corners there? And I can make it a lot more dramatic, obviously. I can make it um, 20 pixels. Now, whether you think that looks good or not, I mean, that's kind of an aesthetic you can decide upon. It can have a, a positive effect to it. So that's just an example. You know what's really neat about working with uh, borders like that? Because you can actually control all the borders separately or all the border radiuses separately, right? So I could create the top one to be this radius, that one to be a different radius. And... <clears throat> There's a couple little interesting things that you can do by working with the the shapes of things in CSS, right? So by default, when you have an item on a CSS that you're controlling with CSS, the thing, if you give it a height and a width and a background, you can see it, it's square because it's 100 by 100, right? Makes sense. So if you want a rectangle, wider. You want a circle, all you have to do is create something that's 100 pixels wide by 100 pixels tall, and then the border radius is 50. So really, this is a box with corners that are really rounded. Now, the thing that I find fascinating about this, right, is, okay, well, that's not all. If you can plan it out, you can create any of the shapes that are scrolling by, and they give you all the code for it. What, an arrow? Oh, yeah. Look at some of the ones that are coming up. And it's all done with CSS. You just have to figure out the math that goes with it, and then you can make it happen. So I just want to give you ideas for things that you can possibly do. All right, back to the slideshow. Let's finish it up. All right, so some examples of rounded corners. You can have square corners. You can actually do the same thing with that acronym, remember, trouble, top, right, bottom, left. Here's another cool one. I like this one as well. I am aware that I got an extra little curly bracket in there. I'll fix that. The box shadow... Um, notice it's got a few different settings. And basically what these are are X, Y, and blur, and then color. And I'll show you how that lays out on the screen. I'm going to save my work, which I guess I already did. I'm going to do a refresh. And I don't know if you can tell. It's hard up on this big screen. But you can see that there's a little bit of a shadow. The first two numbers in that code, that 5 and the 5, are x offset y offset and what that means is that we're shifting the shadow five pixels one way to the right positive number five pixels down and then the blur which is the third value diffuses it so it, it gives it like five pixels worth of fuzziness it's the best way i can explain it and then of course you can choose the color as well i'm not a huge fan of using grays to do that. I would typically just choose black. Um, you can see the difference. It's a little bit stronger. And it makes it pretty apparent that it's there. But it, it, it can be a really neat effect. And you can do stuff, for example, like this, where that can also be a negative number. Notice it moved it the other direction. If you wanted to balance on all four sides, you just set these for zero, the first two. And then you might have to increase that third one. We'll find out. Yeah, probably have to increase that blur to maybe like 10 pixels. All right, so it makes it seem like it's coming out of the screen just a little bit. Just a little bit of visual effect, basically. All right, back to that PowerPoint. Another one that's cool, and we've already played with this, at least to a certain degree, is this opacity setting. But we mixed it into like one of our color choices.
but this can actually be applied to any item on a page. So if you had like an H1 tag, in fact, we could just throw an H1 tag in there for the sake of it. I'm going to go to my HTML file. Right at the top of it, let's put in an H1. And then in my style sheet, I'm going to create an H1 style. And then inside there, I'm just going to say opacity. And then in the form of a percentage without the percent sign. So if I want it to be 50% opaque, I would type in 0 0.5 and save that. And then if we take a look, you can see that I put in the H1, and you, you can see that it's a little grayed out, so that it's a little bit see-through, which is kind of neat. Now, you can apply that, once again, to any HTML element, and you can leverage that to create some really neat effects if you plan things out properly. Now this RGBA color thing that's on the next slide, that's what I was just using. And we learned about the RGB colors already, but that last digit there is that transparency or that opacity feature that you can leverage. Once again, that goes from 0 to 1, basically a percentage of how see-through it is. They do really actually kind of a nice job here. Um, this is a pretty good use where you have something that has a large graphic in the background and you know I could probably steal that idea right I like it so much I'm gonna borrow it I'm gonna choose a different font here I'm, I'm just looking to let Dreamweaver kinda of choose a font for me and then um, I'm gonna make the font size maybe like 300 percent Not so, not so impressive, but it's getting there. <laughs> Play with it. Find an effect that you like. There is also one other color format that we really didn't talk about much, and I don't see a lot of web designers using it. Who I do see using it are graphic designers that convert to web designers uh, because there's this other format for color called HSLA. It stands for Hue, Saturation, Lightness, and Alpha. Alpha, once again, is the transparency. But it's a different way to mix colors is basically all it is. So uh, if you use better graphics program, it will demonstrate those things to you. Did I show you how to do gradients last time? We talked about those? No. OK. Let me show you what we used to do in the old days. Back in my day, we used to manually create gradients for web pages. And I'll, I'll demonstrate it really fast. And what we would do is we would use a graphics program. Now, we would also leverage the capability of the browser to repeat X or Y and get kind of crafty. And I'll show you what we used to do as soon as Photoshop decides to participate here. All right. I'm going to create a new file. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create something that's really tall and narrow. So I'm creating this image that's a thousand pixels tall, 20 pixels wide. And tools like this and, and products like GIMP and, and Pixlr have this tool available as well, have what they call a gradient tool. And it allows me to go from one color to another. And this is a preset. I don't expect you guys to be doing this. But it creates this like effect, right? You can see that it goes from one color and it gradually transitions. That's that's a gradient. Now what we would do is we would save this image. And then we would set that as our background. So I'm going to put that in here. And I want to save it as, probably a JPEG is fine. I'm 
and I'm just going to call it BG Gradient. Oops, it's giving me some more options here. That's fine. And then instead of using Rick and Carl, watch what I'm going to do here is I'm going to hide it in my comments so I can bring it back in a moment. I'm going to put in, in fact, really what I should do is put all this stuff in. The new one. And then I'm going to tell it to repeat X. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> That's right. It is in my images folder. So when I refresh this, look at what happens. Oh, that didn't work out too well. Did it? Looks horrible. What's that? Is it too tall? Yeah, it's kind of yeah, it's kind of tall. Maybe we should change that image. So this is the beauty of having the tool available. That's better, right? In fact, maybe I could just go like this. All right, that'll work. So let's save it. We'll save as and make sure it's saved as a JPEG. All right. Yes, replace it. Okay, now yes, that's fine too. Hello, it's not working. See, it happens to me too, folks. Not a reason to get frustrated. It makes, it's making me wonder if I got an error in my code. I must have an error in my code. So let's take, let's figure out why. Anybody see anything I'm missing? Well, the first thing I'll do is I'll do this. Let me get rid of that and just see if it even shows up. Um, no, it, uh, it should automatically pop in there. Did I spell it right? Looks fine. Oh, this this might break it. Right there. That's that's what it is. All right. So you see the effect, right? So we used to do this. We This is the process. We'd have to go to Photoshop. We'd create the gradient. We'd have to size it and place it and write all this code. But we're still loading an image each time. What they've come up with in, in CSS3 is the ability to actually declare a gradient using code. And the browser does the work. I set the starting color and the ending color. And boom, it fixes it. So that's a much easier approach. So that, that's kind of the point there. All right, that wraps this chapter. We're going to take another short break, and we'll come back and move on.